Uh, we have a great, great pleasure and opportunity uh, for someone that come all the way from the East Coast to speak to us. And this person doesn't really require any kind of introduction. Okay, you look at him and you know that he's distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to speak something to us with his own observations, his own knowledge, and his experience on a subject that is very, very dear to our hearts. And I'll let him tell you what he's going to speak. The only thing is, I know he speaks several languages, and I just hope that he will speak in English for us today. <laughs> okay, we'll try. David, yeah. so, so we can understand, okay? So without further introduction, I'll give you David, Dr. David Ackman. Well, thank you very much. That was a very undeserved, generous introduction, and I'm extremely grateful to uh, um, you, the University of Southern California for inviting me here, for um, agreeing to have me speak on this topic without um, really knowing anything about me, perhaps having read a few of my books. But uh, it's a wonderful place to come to. Um, I have to tell you, I have a very strong, favorable opinion about this university. Uh, I teach at a small private college in Northern Virginia. And the favorite student in a number of my classes is an undergraduate who began her studies here at USC. And she has demonstrated a great um, breadth of uh, brain power and experience and knowledge, so I'm delighted to be able to share that experience with you here um, by coming today. Um, I really am very grateful indeed for all the arrangements that were made uh, to bring me over this weekend and the sort of conjunction of different uh, organizations that I had to uh, uh, get into a sort of systematic order and it's all worked out extremely well. I'm very grateful to come here. A few weeks ago, there was a prominent gathering of Protestant Christian leaders in Cape Town, South Africa. It was called the Lausanne Conference Follow-Up. And this has been a series of conferences held every few years um, after being initiated by the evangelist Billy Graham in 1974 in Lausanne, Switzerland. And very distinguished Christian, Protestant Christian leaders are brought from several countries in the world and uh, are, are invited to speak. This year, there were 200 delegates invited from China. Uh, which was the largest number ever, which was itself an indication of the incredible significance that China has assumed, that has grown into, as one of the major players in the global community of Christian countries. Sadly, of these 200 delegates who were invited to Cape Town, only about two or three actually were able to attend the Cape Town Conference. The others were detained, prevented from boarding aircraft, had their documents confiscated, their passports canceled, uh, were brought in for questioning by various authorities, which was a real tragedy because the Cape Town organizers had taken the trouble to invite both representatives of the um, unofficial house churches of China, which constitute the majority of China's Christians, and representatives of the official organizations, the Protestant Free Self-Patriotic Movement, and uh, I don't think the Catholic Church was invited. It probably wouldn't have been interested anyway. But regrettably, the authorities and the official uh, 
Protestant organizations in China rejected the invitation because they objected to the fact that delegates had been invited whom they had not previously known about and of whom they certainly had not approved. Uh, this is a, a rather sad event because China is now economically the second most powerful country in the world. It recently overtook Japan. China is recognized as a major world power. China was granted the honor of being the venue of the 2008 Olympic Games. Uh, China is respected uh, throughout the world and is broadly popular in the world. So it is a little bit of a puzzle why these fairly insignificant church leaders failed to get on the plane to go to a conference in South Africa. But thereby lies a very interesting story. Nobody really knows how many Christians there are in China. But experts say that quite possibly within a few years, China will be the world's largest Christian country. Now, this is an extraordinary statistic. Well, it's not a statistic. It's, it's kind of an estimate. It's extraordinary because Christianity in China has gone through, I would say, three surges and three great disappearances. And in spite of everything, it is resurfaced, and now it is a more powerful presence in the People's Republic of China than ever before. Let's take some basic facts that most people whether they're in China or they're journalists or they're scholars outside of China, agree to be corresponding to the truth. In 1949, when the People's Libera Liberation Army entered Beijing uh, in, in January, the number of Chinese Christian believers was estimated to be perhaps 4 million of whom three million were baptized members of the Roman Catholic Church, and about 900,000 were Protestant Christians. Now, four million people might not seem a very big number of people, and it probably wasn't, considering the fact that China had been subject to Western missionary efforts for at least um, 130 years prior to the arrival of the communists in 1949. And China had been the target of missionary efforts going right back to the Tang Dynasty in the 7th century. Let me just give you a little brief sketch of the history of the Christian contacts from the outside world with China, because it's, it's a very interesting story. There were, or I should say there are legends, and nobody has been able to prove any of these uh, stories, that St. Thomas, the um, evangelist who brought the Christian gospel to India and actually died in India, at some point in his sojourn in India made a special trip to China. We don't know, there's no archaeological evidence, there's no literary evidence whether he did that or not. But one significant Chinese scholar um, who used to be, is now retired, but he used to be uh, teaching at the Nanjing Theological Seminary, has done a study of um, Han Dynasty stone rubbings in Henan province. And he has come to the conclusion that the, stat, that the portrayals in the stone rubbings could only have been made by people of Christian faith. One small example, one of the rubbings that he discovered in the museum of uh, the rubbings in uh, Luoyang, 
was a portrait of five loaves and two fish. Well, that doesn't come from Buddhist scriptures. Um, there's only one place that could have come from, and of course it must have come from somebody who had knowledge of the Christian faith. So, we don't know whether or not there were Christian missionaries in China in the first and second century, but what we do know for sure is that in the Tang Dynasty, a very important missionary church called the Church of the East that was based in basically Mesopotamia and Persia and had bishoprics and archbishoprics all across the Middle East, India, Central Asia, right into Western China. This church sent a special delegation to the court of the Tang Dynasty emperor of the time. And in 635 AD, missionaries of a group that called itself the Religion of Light, they were very clearly missionaries from the Church of the East, from Persia, entered China, established very congenial relations with the Tang Dynasty court. And if you go to Xi'an today and you visit the uh, forest of Stele, which is uh, a museum with some wonderful Chinese stone carvings, you will find what is called the Nestorian Tablet. And the Nestorian Tablet was um, carved in about 751, which is 120 years or so after the arrival of the missionaries there. And it records the very cordial relations of the practitioners of this, or the missionaries of this religion, and the Tang, Tang Dynasty court. Now, if you are a little bit adventurous and you are interested in other places to visit in the Xi'an area other than the obvious ones, the Terracotta Warriors, which of course is a wonderful archaeological collection. But if you wander outside of Xi'an, you will come to a lopsided um, monastery. Actually, it looks like a Buddhist pagoda, but in fact, the lopsided tower is the tower that originally belonged to a Christian monastery. And this is possibly one of the oldest surviving churches in Asia, certainly the oldest surviving church in China. And uh, the, it was discovered to have been not a Taoist or a Buddhist temple, but a Christian uh, place of worship, only as recently as 1999 when an English archaeologist investigated the pagoda climbed up to the rather rickety second floor level and discovered a whole array of paintings and carvings which clearly were Christian. And uh, subsequent visits showed that not only was the pagoda tower uh, belonging to this uh, Christian church assemblage built probably in the eighth century, but uh, the main building attached to the pagoda had survived at least as long as 1966, when very sadly it was destroyed by Red Guard depredations. So the church in China certainly goes back to the Tang Dynasty. The people who brought the gospel to China were called Nestorians because the Church of the East sprung out of the missionary efforts of one Nestorius who was, um, I think, rather unfairly mislabeled as a heretic for some rather sort of obscure theological <coughs> interpretations of um, the role of Mary, was she mother of God, and so forth. But the Nestorians is the name that is given to all the missionaries of the Church of the East that planted 
churches and bishoprics and dioceses all the way across Asia, and they were the people who brought the gospel to China. Well, the Nestorian Christians turned out to be, as some Christian communities in different countries become, not exactly as interested in retaining high ethical standards as they might have. We know that because when the next major contact came between the Roman Catholic Church in the West and China, it was because the Pope in Rome was terribly worried that Temujin, otherwise known as Genghis Khan, the great Mongol ruler, might uh, launch yet another raid upon Western Europe and demolish the uh, Christian countries uh, that stood in his way. And so a, a handful of Italian Catholic missionaries were sent out to meet with uh, the Mongol Khans in the capital of their empire at Karakoram. And they discovered a large presence of Nestorian Christians. And they wrote rather disparagingly about this community as implying that they really weren't living a very godly Christian life. And in fact, they weren't particularly uh, energetic in spreading the Christian message. So you had a number of Christian missionary efforts sent out from Rome primarily aimed at the Mongol conquerors of Central Asia and China. And there's a very interesting letter that was brought back to Rome by Marco Polo uh, that was dictated by the Chinese Mongol emperor um, Kublai Khan, the grandson of uh, Genghis appealing to the Pope in Rome to send highly qualified, well-educated advisors who could instruct the people of China and Mongolia and that part of Asia in morality that would benefit their civilization. Well, the Pope in Rome uh, took about 10 years to reply to this letter, which uh, I guess makes him a rather uh, dilatory business manager, and the opportunity was missed uh, by the time the Roman Catholic hierarchy was willing to pay attention to this request, uh, essentially interest had declined. But the next great episode in the Christian contact with China is the arrival of the Jesuits and Matteo Ricci in 1601. Matteo Ricci was a Jesuit um, who arrived in South China in Canton in 1681. It took him 20 years to get permission to reside in Beijing. I'm going to use the word Beijing, although it was obviously called Peking um, in, in Western parlance in those days. But it took him 20 years to get there. And one of the amazing achievements of Ricci and the Jesuits was to master Chinese culture, and particularly the Chinese written and spoken language, in such a way that it had a profound effect upon all the scholars with whom Ricci met. There's a wonderful book on the topic by um, um, a professor from Yale, Yale University called The Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci. And this gives you an example of his brilliance. Ricci was a Renaissance man in the sense not only that he mastered several areas of learning, but he mastered some of the Renaissance skills, which included memorization. And he could sit at a dinner table with Chinese fellow guests, listen to a Tang Dynasty poem of 20 lines recited aloud in his presence, and then repeat the poem perfectly, word for word, 
as though he had memorized it two hours earlier. Quite extraordinary feat. And the Jesuits who headed the uh, mission in Beijing after uh, Ricci were equally talented. For example, Adam Schall, the German, and Ferdinand Verbiest. They were very useful to the Chinese imperial family because they were able to predict uh, astronomical events like eclipses of the sun and the moon and when the harvest uh, high point would come. They could predict that mathematically more accurately than either the Muslim scholars of the day or China's own scholars. And so they were highly prized. And it's very interesting. Fairbeast probably got closer to the Chinese Kangxi Emperor, who ruled from 1652 to 1722, than any other foreigner ever came to know a Chinese leader. And the Kangxi Emperor is regarded as probably the most distinguished and able of all China's imperial rulers. And we don't know whether or not he persuaded the emperor to adopt Christianity. He probably didn't, because the emperor of China felt that he had a particular spiritual role as uh, partaking of the uh, Ming Dynasty rituals and so forth to mediate between heaven and, and earth. So he would not have been willing to be baptized. But the Chinese emperor wrote a poem, uh, which is an extraordinary poem, uh, called The Cross. And most Chinese Christians in China, with whom I've spoken, believe that this is evidence that even if the Kangxi Emperor never actually got baptized and joined the Roman Catholic Church, he was close enough to Christian belief to understand what it was all about. Well, the Jesuits unfortunately got into deep trouble with um, other, pro uh, other Roman Catholic orders in Europe because they insisted that the Chinese custom of venerating ancestors was not actually an act of worship so much as a ritual form of veneration, of giving honor to people who had come before one. And there was a big squabble in Rome between the Jesuits and the Franciscans and the Dominicans. And the Chinese emperor, the Kangxi emperor, just got fed up. He said, well, if you guys can't even figure out what you believe, forget it. I'm just not interested. And whereas the Roman Catholic churches had been able to establish churches, um, the, the Roman Catholic authorities had been able to establish churches, schools, and a sort of scholarly centers in China. By the time that the Kangxi Emperor died in 1722 and, was, and his son succeeded him, two years later his son gave the order of expelling all the Roman Catholic Christians from China. And that was a drastic move which completely destroyed the work, the patient work of more than a hundred years that the Jesuits had established in China. Many people in Europe thought, well, that's the end of Christianity in China. Well, it wasn't, because the following century, in the year 1807, the English missionary Robert Morrison arrived in Canton and began uh, the presence of a number of very prominent Protestant missionaries in China. Morrison was a very interesting guy. Um, he was an Englishman who wanted to travel to Canton. The only way you could get to Canton in those days from England was either by American ship or a British ship. 
But if it was a British ship, it had to belong to the British East India Company. The British East India Company did not like missionaries. And so they said, Mr. Morrison, you seem to be a nice guy. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. You, you seem to be a nice guy, but sorry, we don't want you in China messing up our carefully constructed relationships with Ch Chinese officials. You better ask the Americans to take you to Canton. So that's what Robert Morrison did. He traveled to New York, which was, you know, a fairly um, lengthy and arduous trip in those days across the Atlantic. And then he persuaded an American uh, trading vessel captain to sail, to take him all the, way around, all the way around Cape Horn across the Pacific. And he arrived in Canton in September 1807. And on his way across the Pacific, the, there's a story that nobody has, I think, convincingly denied that the captain of the ship, a sort of very gruff American uh, seaman, said, uh, Mr. Morrison, do you think you're going to have any impact on the idolatry of the great Chinese empire? To which Morrison famously replied, no, sir, but I think God will. And <laughs> Morrison then set about translating the, the gospel, uh, the, the New Testament into Chinese, and then he translated the Old Testament. Um, he only, before he died in, in 1829, I think he only converted or saw the baptism of, uh, uh, I think, 10 Chinese individuals. And many people would have been completely discouraged by this experience. And added to which, Morrison's arrival in China was coincident with the Western major powers' worst episode of dealings with China. That is the importation of opium into the great Chinese emperor, empire. And the Chinese understandably profoundly resented this. They went to war with England. Now, it's important to remember that most of the evangelical Christians in England were completely against the English policy of trading opium with the Chinese and tried very hard to stop it. But nevertheless, they didn't succeed. And um, you had the interesting story of one of the most gifted of the Western missionaries to China in the Morrison era was called Karl Gutzlaff, brilliant linguist. He could speak several Chinese dialects so well that Chinese would not believe that he was not Chinese. Although he looked like, a, looked like me, I suppose. Uh, they, didn't, they couldn't imagine how he could speak their dialects so well and not be Chinese. Well, Gutzlaff, uh, infamously was handing out tracts on one side of a small boat from which opium was been, being un unloaded on the other side, which certainly didn't create a very good impression of Christianity. But the most important person in this Western effort to bring the Christian message to China was a man called Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor founded an organization in 1864 five called the China Inland Mission. And if you want to know why China has absorbed and developed and grown in Christianity to such an extraordinary extent, it is largely due to the efforts of Hudson Taylor. The China Inland Mission required volunteers to live like Chinese, to speak Chinese, to eat Chinese, to live with Chinese, and to avoid the enclaves of the foreigners that were associated with Western major powers. It's very interesting. When the Boxer Rebellion broke out in the year 1900, um, a terrifying attack on foreigners resident in the in North China particularly, um, 
something like 213 missionaries, foreign missionaries, were killed in the Boxer Rebellion, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. But it's, it's an interesting fact that 189 of the 213 or so who were killed were China Inland Mission missionaries. And yet, Hudson Taylor, now in his old age, insisted that the China Inland Mission would not accept any compensation from the Chinese government, which was being forced out of the Chinese government by the Western powers that had taken revenge on the depredations of the boxes. It's just extraordinary that, that Hudson Taylor refused to regard himself as a victim and thought that it had been an honor to serve the Chinese people. Now, it's very interesting that the Christian churches in China that have grown up in the Chinese countryside, particularly in Henan, most of them were founded by Chinese who themselves had been trained by CIM missionaries, China Inland Mission missionaries. And if you think about the province in China in which the Christians have become most numerous, which is Henan province, you find that was the province in which the China Inland Missionaries were strongest. Well, fast forwarding, uh, fast forwarding to the 20th century, there was a very strong nationalist movement against Christianity in the 1920s, probably fueled by China's newfound nationalism that developed after the 1911 rebellion and the sort of radical new ideas beginning to influence Chinese intellectuals from the Bolshevik uh, movement in, in Russia. And many Chinese intellectuals were becoming Marxist. And so by the 1920s, it was kind of dangerous in many parts of China to be a Western missionary. Many Western missionaries actually fled China in 1925 because there were widespread nationalist demonstrations, I think quite justifiably arguing against or demonstrating against uh, the British tendency to try to break strikes and to uh, suppress China's emerging nationalism. So then you have the terrible period of the 1930s and the Japanese invasion of China in 1937. That really brought an end to any widespread, strong Western missionary effort. And when that was followed by the Chinese Civil War between the nationalists and the communists that lasted the period from 1946 to 1949, many people thought, quite understandably, that Christianity had now come to the end of its rope in China, that there had been 120 years of Protestant missionary efforts to uh, persuade the Chinese to adopt Christianity. The Catholics had been there in force as well, but the fruit of their missionary efforts was kind of meager. And so, when the missionaries, the few remaining Western missionaries, were kicked out of China in the early 1950s, probably by 1953, the last of them had to leave, uh, many people said, that's the end of the Chinese Christian experience. Uh, forget about it. Communism is here. Most Chinese are grateful that the Civil War has come to an end. The communist regime is doing its best to restore normality and prosperity to China. The Christian churches were allowed a sort of token presence in Beijing, Shanghai, and a few other cities under an umbrella organization called the Three Self-Patriotic Movement, which was designed to supervise all of the efforts of Protestant uh, 
clergy in China, most, well, by this time all of Chinese origin, um, and to persuade these clergy to espouse communist doctrine and communist theory for the transformation of society. Now, the clergy didn't specifically have to adopt atheism, but they had to approve of Communist Party policies, which uh, certainly were opposed to many of the Christian ethics that the missionaries had been preaching for decades. That might have led to a sort of living death, if you like, of Christianity, a sort of fossilized museum existence for a few followers of the Christian faith. Had it not been for one of the most extraordinary events of the 20th century, Mao Zedong's imposition upon China of the great proletarian cultural revolution. Now, this was just an incredibly dramatic event. Uh, if, if some of you don't know what it was like in microcosm to be in the middle of that, uh, Rong Zhang's book, Wild Swans, is a wonderful illustration of how one family was caught up in the vicious political name-calling and persecution that went on. But one of the effects of the Cultural Revolution was that all religious establishments, Buddhist, Taoist, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, were completely banned and closed down in China. And famously, or infamously, is, if you prefer, Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, spoke to some visiting Western reporters in 1975. And she said, you ask about Christianity in China, that's just something for the museum. But ironically, the Cultural Revolution provided an astonishing new freedom for rural evangelists to wander from village to village quite clandestinely, providing ministry, encouragement, support to families all over China who had experienced the persecution uh, that was endemic to the whole Cultural Revolution experience. Red Guards chased anybody who was thought to possess uh, Christian scriptures or Buddhist scriptures or, or Muslim or Hindu scriptures for that point, uh, for that matter. Sometimes uh, Chinese Christians who even non-clergy people were killed, executed for possessing scriptures. But one of the things that happened during the Cultural Revolution was that rural groups of Christians began to organize themselves uh, clandestinely, but very effectively. And so by the early 1970s, there was evidence, if you cared to pay attention to what was going on in the Chinese countryside, evidence of a very powerful rural evangelical movement taking place in China. I'll tell you about this from my personal experience. I was in Hong Kong as a reporter in uh, the early 1970s, and that was a time when a number of Chinese were swimming out to Hong Kong as refugees. And I had the, the unusual experience and the privilege as a reporter of being able to triangulate the story of one refugee from the city of Fuzhou who told a story about persecution by the police of Christian activity in his city. And shortly afterwards, I met the policeman himself who had been involved in this persecution. And he had become a refugee. I mean, it's a very remarkable story. The man had a, um, an, an unfortunate condition of nose cancer. Uh, he claims, this is his story, that he was prayed for by uh, the Christians whom he was persecuting. Uh, 
and his illness went away. Now that's very interesting because it became apparent from anybody who was following what was going on in the 1970s that one characteristic of the growth of the Chinese church was the belief by large numbers of Chinese that health problems were successfully being dealt with by Christian groups. Now, I'm not asking you to kind of believe in miracles or anything like that. All I'm saying is, as a reporter, these are the stories that kept coming out of China. <laughs> and eventually, even if the stories are not true, enough people are believing them to begin the process of becoming Christian. Well, when the Cultural Revolution came to an end and the new policy of openness and reform to the outside world was introduced by Deng Xiaoping, um, all of a sudden, these Chinese Christian groups found themselves operating with no clear rules for what was allowed and what was not allowed. And so for a crucial period of a few years in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, Chinese evangelists went from village to village spreading the message of the gospel and uh, bringing new members into their fold. And it's, it's a very interesting story. I had the, the opportunity, it was a wonderful privilege, to do some reporting of the church in China in, um, in 2002. And I heard the story of one network of house, group, house church groups, the, it was called the Tang He Fellowship, that in 1994 in April, a very specific date, had sent out on a missionary trip to 22 of China's provinces a group of 70 young Chinese evangelists from that church. It sent them out, it gave them the equivalent in Chinese currency of about $200, and it said, come back in exactly six months and tell us what you've done. And I managed to find a few of these people who'd been on that particular mission trip, and they just had extraordinary stories. Uh, some of them had gone to places like Inner Mongolia, and they found a group of 15 other Christians kind of furtively meeting with each other. And they had gone in and encouraged this group, and 10 years later, a group of 15 had now turned into a network of churches with a total membership of about 150,000. Now, this was happening all over China in the 80s and 90s, what you see happening is a rural Christian explosion. Not very much at that time happening in the cities. But by about 2000, you're beginning to see a number of Chinese intellectuals, mostly from a cultural perspective only, not really interested in the spiritual side of things, but a number of intellectuals interested in Christianity as a kind of phenomenon. And so, starting probably in the late 90s, several Chinese universities began to start institutes of the study of religion, even institutes for Christian theology, if you can believe that. How many state universities in the United States would do something like that? But anyway, um, and from what started as a university move, movement, you began to get the growth of a number of urban professionals who wanted to attend church. And so these urban professionals didn't want to go to the government-sponsored church because they didn't want to hear politicized sermons, and they didn't want clergy who had been appointed merely because they were considered politically reliable by the Communist Party. So they wanted their own clergy to, to lead them. And 
these new churches have sprung up all over major cities in China, particularly in Beijing. They're under huge pressure. Um, whenever a large enough number of people meet, obviously they can't meet in private homes anymore, so they want to rent an auditorium or somewhere that's large enough to absorb, to contain all the people, and then often, as often as not, the authorities come to the landlord, put tremendous pressure on them uh, to uh, cancel the lease, and so these poor urban house church members are left literally uh, sort of milling around in the park in freezing cold winter weather. But one of the developments of Christianity in China is that as China has developed a legal system capable of dealing with contract law and other things, many Chinese lawyers have taken up the issue of uh, getting permission for church groups to rent property and uh, representing clergy who are detained and questioned and really standing up for them. And many of these human rights lawyers are actually Christian. Some of them have, have suffered terribly at the hands of the authorities for, for their pains. But what you're beginning to see is the seepage into many parts of intellectual and professional culture of a series of values where freedom of conscience and freedom of belief and freedom of worship is regarded as a very high priority. Now, this is not true in any previous period in Chinese history. So you have to ask yourself, and I'll, I'll just end on this note, why? Why are Chinese who have always been described as not being particularly religious, why are they suddenly taking an interest in a clear, clearly defined spiritual faith like Christianity? Well, I don't think there's any one reason. I think there are many different reasons. Clearly, Chinese were totally disillusioned during the Cultural Revolution with Marxism, Leninism. They did not believe and they don't believe now that Marxism, Leninism is a real guide to life. Many Chinese also have become wealthy in the new prosperity introduced by Deng Xiaoping and the new rules allowing capitalism, but they are seeing things like corruption, the breakup of families, immorality, and they want to know what's the answer to that. So there are many different reasons. But I think one of the factors is that many Chinese have asked the question, and I have a, an account of this in my book, what was it that made the West so successful for so long? Why was the West able to overcome its internal problems continuously? and to expand its power overseas? Was it because the West happened to hit upon the right military technology or just by chance discovered efficient political organization? Or was there something else? And many Chinese have said, we think it might be because Christianity was the secret of the dynamism of the West. And one of the ironies is that in the West, we are seeing more and more intellectuals and academics abandon the values of the Christian faith, which they might have inherited from their grandparents or parents. And more and more of China's intellectuals and professionals and scholars being willing to turn to this interpretation of life. How many Christians are there in China? Nobody knows the answer to that question. It's all a guessing game. But there's a guessing game that's based on reality and that's based on fantasy. The three self-patriotic movement, which 
supervises all the Protestant churches in China, claims that there are about 20 million Chinese who attend the open churches, officially permitted churches on any given Sunday. And they grudgingly admit, well, there might be 10 million or so who are members of the house churches. But the fact is, anybody who has spent any time in China looking into this issue is of the opinion that for every one person who goes to a three-self-patriotic Protestant church, at least three people go to a Protestant house church. So you're already up to possibly 60 million house church members. But even more interesting than that, as the spread of Christianity has continued to grow in China amongst professionals and even Communist Party members, I have a good friend who is a very senior Communist Party member who was baptized as a Christian about a year and a half ago. He has access to very significant information provided by the Public Security Bureau. And he says he thinks the number of China's Christians is now approximately 125 million. Well, even if it's only 80 million, do the math. Four million in 1949 and 80 million today. Can you think of any other country in the world that has shown such an astonishing explosion of Christian believers? I don't think so. And I think it's going to have a huge impact on how China behaves, how China develops, whether China is able to make the transition from a one-party state to some form of pluralistic democracy. I won't define what that might be, but obviously that's got to happen sooner or later. Whether it happens in a peaceful, orderly way will, I think, depend upon whether China's Christians can persuade their fellow Chinese that the way to an orderly transformation of China is through restraint and respect and honor and peaceableness. Now, if that happens with China, inside China, the rest of the world will have a lot to be grateful for. Thank you very much. Don't go away yet. One thing is for sure, that one hour do not do justice for topics like this. So uh, we may have to invite him back some more time and give this subject a more thorough you know, uh, discussion. But this time, I'd like to open up for some questionings. Uh, I know there's people standing at the back. So those uh, standing at the back, you can, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. But for those who are sitting down, uh, would you please uh, stand up if you have a question? And we will have about 15 minutes uh, of to, for the question and answer. Um, and we will have to cut it off because we will have to go to a reception, which is being prepared for you outside. And be, uh, besides, um, we have something that's very, very significant. I think I can turn this off. My voice is loud enough. <laughs> At the back of the, uh, uh, th this room, we do have the books, uh, some of the books that Dr. Ackman uh, had written. Among them is this book, Jesus in China, or Jesus in Beijing. Okay? And we have forms over there that you can fill it in or fill it out. and. Uh, uh, check on which one you want to get. If you do use this form to order the books, Dr. Ackman will pay for postage <laughs> and handling for you. Okay, because it's too 
too heavy for him to carry around. So we convinced uh, him to just do the ordering. So please do that. And also, there's some other uh, information concerning for what else uh, he's doing. So at this time, I'd like to open up for questions. So please, uh, you know, in, yes. Please stand up and, and, and ask your question. Uh, I you. have a question. Uh, you said uh, in the past uh, maybe uh, 30 years, the number of uh, Christians in China growing up quickly. But I just want to know, uh, how do you think uh, if this, uh, these people really believe uh, Jesus? For example, uh, your uh, CCP official uh, friends, he is a CCP member, but he, think, he said he believes Jesus. <coughs> right. uh, so, of course, he is not really believe the communist. Right. So such a guy, do you think he can really believe Jesus? <laughs> that's my question. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a, a very intelligent question. Um, first of all, this particular gentleman uh, was a very careful person. He knew that Communist Party members are not allowed to be members of churches or to go to the mosque. And so he went to his superior officials and he said, look, I'm thinking of becoming a Christian, going to church, getting baptized. Um, I need to get your opinion. Is that okay? Can I still go on doing what I'm doing? Writing editorials in the People's Daily, for example. And uh, the official said, we know you. You're uh, patriotic. Uh, you don't uh, criticize the Communist Party. If you want to go to church, if you want to be baptized, that's fine. That's what they told him. And it's very unusual. I mean, I, I think that's not a very typical case. <laughs> Um, I doubt whether there are many people who have had such an open admission. I mean, he must have been very trusted as a party official. I mean, he was actually a, an instructor, and, well, I won't go into any more detail, but... Uh, um, so clearly he was trusted. And, you know, I don't have to tell you this, sir, Chinese are very pragmatic. And uh, if a guy does a job and does a job well, what he does on Sunday, that's none of my business, you know? I mean, I think, I think that's the attitude in a lot of parts of China, but not everywhere. I, you can't make universal generalizations, I think. Good. Thank you. You have a In 1949, yeah. 我们不知道是否有一个组织可以推动这个转变在中国。但如果它是在80万人和130万人,那是一个增长的10%。而这个数字仍然在增长。现在, there is no census in China that proves that, and there's no official figures. But you go back to, for example, you go back to Chinese colleges, universities, and you make inquiries. How many Christian prayer groups or Bible study groups are on this campus? Oh, I don't know, six or seven. How many were there last year? Two or three. And if you see a pattern of growth, in an area where you can get fairly reliable 
anecdotal evidence. It's certainly not going to be totally reliable statistical evidence. What you can see is a pattern of growth, an increase in the proportion of Christians to the population. If the population of China's Christians is 125 million, that's nearly 10%. If the number is increasing, it will reach a critical mass. And I think the experience of most countries in the world is when you get to 25% of the population believing in anything, whether it's believing in Nazi doctrine of Germany or communism or Christianity, 25% is a critical number that will change the society because you will find individuals in key professions, the law, education, the media. For example, in the case of South Korea, South Korea's population now is about 30% Christian. But, um, and, and that's statistically fairly easy to, to uh, nail down. But before South Korea became 30% Christian, when it was about 25%, you began to see a very significant change. Uh, just after the Olympic Games in 1988, I think it was, in Korea, uh, South Korea went through political change. Its leaders were identified as Christians, and it made a very successful transition from a dictatorship to a democracy. Now, how is that possible? I think it's possible because people are willing to suppress their personal ambitions for the sake of a larger community. And I hope that is what is going to happen in China. So you may you will have more Christians, then wait. You can change the political region in China? Eventually, yes. And I started because I'm wondering if the Communist Party can allow this kind of thing happen. Well, the, the Communist Party, there are some members of the Communist Party who will always resist this. But uh, as I've said, the Chinese are very pragmatic. There are some Communist Party members, for example, provincial secretaries of the party, who have been asked, what do you want for your province? And they have said, we want more Christians. Now, why? Because on the whole, Christians who are in business don't cheat as much as other people. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from the back. Yeah. How South Korean Christians actually did a lot in terms of transforming Korean society from a military dictatorship to democratic society. That is very true. But South Korean churches has a main difference from the Chinese churches at the moment because they were not controlled or permitted by the government. It was a separate organization. So people actually involved a lot in the anti-government protests because they found that it was going against their Christian belief to love your neighbors as yourself. But in, in China, I think that must be a most diff um, a lot different situation. Previously, I saw one of the uh, American documentary about uh, Chinese churches, and the sermons were so uh, shocking to me because it was so blessing the government, blessing China as if it's the second Jerusalem, and it's like the second chosen people. If the church that permitted by the government are so happily in hand with each other, then how can you possibly uh, see, uh, foresee uh, more uh, like a transforming uh, movement from Christians? Well, that's, that's a very good question. And I think the Chinese Christians are going to have to decide that themselves. At what point does their love for China require them to uh, agree with the government and obey the government? And at what point do they begin to stand up for things like the rights of freedom of conscience and so on? Um, if you look at most of the countries of the West, you find that a struggle to achieve freedom of conscience, and very often that meant against a state-controlled church, was an important element in the construction of democratic privilege. 
and democratic practice. Uh, many people believe that the Protestant Reformation, and particularly the Puritan movement in the United States, was one of the ingredients that led to the willingness of Americans to resist the British crown, which of course led to the American Revolution. Now, I don't know what will happen in China, but I, I know that there are, there are clashes going on at this point, and the Chinese government is going to have to decide whether it will allow freedom of conscience for its Christians, or whether it wants to be in a sort of permanent battle uh, to suppress the rights to worship that Christians desire. And I think how the Christians behave in this struggle with the Chinese government is going to be determining uh, what course China takes in the future. Okay. Because of time, we're going to allow only two more questions. You yeah. have. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for talking about this really important conversation that we need to be having. Um, I have several friends who are missionaries in China, and they're seeing a, a, a new trend that the students just aren't as open um, to the, the Christian message because they're more concerned about. Uh, material success and, and making a name for, for themselves that way rather than what's the meaning of life. So do you think that there will be, um, that the, the rapid rise of Christianity will you know, slow down a little bit, just gradually keep increasing? Or do you think um, with the rural explosion that that will keep the numbers going higher? Like, what do you foresee for the future of this? Well, it's a good question. I think the, the impact of um, consumerism, if you like, and material ambition is very destructive to spiritual values in any society, whether it's Buddhist or Hindu or Christian. And I think the Chinese churches are certainly suffering from this. But on the other hand, um, you are finding more and more um, Chinese standing up for legal rights than used to be the case. And very often those people are lawyers who have actually become Christians themselves. So although you may not get the rise in numbers uh, among students, or for that matter in the countryside, um, I think it's likely that there is going to be a continuing growth uh, in the professional communities, um, which I think will have a long-term impact. Very good. One last question. Okay. It goes to you, the, the gentleman in the back, who's bowing south with males and green males. <laughs> uh, you said that there are two different churches in China, offshore churches and home churches. So, uh, who are attending your home church and why? Definitely. Well, okay, the, the three self-patriotic organization is the Protestant Umbrella Group authorized by the United Front Work Department of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the United Front Work Department tells the State Administration for Religious Affairs how many graduates from Theology Seminary are allowed to graduate this year. And they also say to the pastors, you may preach on this topic, but you may not preach on that topic. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the pastors of the three self-churches are actually evangelical Christian. Mm -hmm. They're genuine, they're sincere, they want to spread the Christian message as they understand it. But many people who come into Christianity for the first time don't want to go to a place where they're going to hear a partly political message. They want to be sure that the pastors and the preachers and the leaders are not part of any political system. And so overwhelmingly, new Christians in China tend to want to go to the house churches because they know that the house churches are not going to be under government control. Good. We have one uh, question from uh, Rob. Well, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was excellent. Uh, 
And in fact, my question follows very much on the question that was just asked. Three quarters of my question was contained there. I heard uh, Max Weber uh, being discussed without being named, right? Uh, the notion that that's what leads, to, uh, Calvinism leads right. to the, to right. the uh, triumph of, of English capitalism, right. you know, right. that sort of thing. And that's why some intellectuals are drawn to it. One of the striking things in the numbers game is that while we may not know how many Christians there are in China, we do know how many Communist Party members there are. Yes. <laughs> and there are about 70 million of those. And so by your reckon reckoning, there are already more Christians. And of course, there's some double counting there. Right. Uh, and, and that is striking. But my question follows very much along these lines. And it, it, uh, the, what is it about the house churches that separates them? Is it only the nature of official sanction and a different message from the pulpit? Or is it, are there other activities, other support systems that the house churches deliver that are not available from the official churches? Uh, because, of course, uh, in the West, we associate uh, Christian movements not simply with what happens for an hour on Sunday, right. Right. but the community that arises around it. And I was wondering if you could address that question. How are those communities somehow, house church communities, somehow different from whatever arises elsewhere? Well, first of all, the, the house church <laughs> movements, the different house churches, um, don't have any political directives or any limitations on what they teach or preach. Now, that may lead and has led in some cases to crazy heresies. And uh, house churches are as frightened of the heresies as the three self patriotic churches are. But um, heresies actually don't last very long in a situation where there are healthy, independent, regular churches because they kind of shout them down eventually. And, and, uh, but I think that, for example, things like evangelism, it is illegal in China to explain what the Christian message is to another person unless you are in a church. You're not allowed to do it. It's illegal. And the house churches clearly take the risk of having communities where people are invited, made to feel welcome, told what the Christian gospel is, and not given any restraints on it, or don't exhibit any restraints in explaining it. And this is very attractive. I mean, I don't think most people in most countries, and I think this is true of China, are drawn to new movements that are very specifically under government control, any government control. And I think they are attracted to movements that seem to express freedom in, in the general human context. Well, okay, you can cut the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the official churches and house churches, and uh, I have many friends who are believing Christianity. But from my personal experience, I find that for Christian Christians in China is pretty much fra well, not fragmented, but they are factions. Yes. And mm -hmm. people believe in God from different reasons. Yes. And some of them are purely utilitarian. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Purposes and. Comparatively rarely, I encounter people who truly take it as a faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, it means that, well, I think one of the reasons that Christianity can spread so fast in China is because it's very active religion. That means people usually reach out to convert you. And like Buddhism and other religions in China, they don't actively come out and convert people. Right. And so, in another word, I guess it just means that those people can actually maybe believe in any religion right. if they are rich. Right. Well, 
So that makes it pretty, I'm not sure if it's stable or not. Because when there is pressure, mm, right. people may just mm. cover to believe something else. Well, that's possible, but actually, it's very interesting. If you ask house church leaders um, whether they would like to see a complete end to government restrictions on religion, they say no. We actually don't want to see an end to persecution because persecution has the effect of purifying people and me making people reveal whether, whether their faith is serious or not. And uh, I think that's probably true in any society, that if, if it's too easy to have some particular faith, it doesn't matter whether you have it or not. Mm -hmm. It's only when you count the cost mm -hmm. and you realize there's a price to be paid, and in your personal life there's a price to be paid. Um, if you ask yourself that question and answer it, yes, I'm willing to pay that price, then you're more likely to be a serious follower of the faith than just any old Tom, Dick, or Harry who just shows up because it's a fashionable thing to do. Thank you.